Good morning. We're back for another Member Focus Monday. It's 9 a.m. Monday morning. Uh, we are going to give everyone just till 9.01 and then we'll get started this morning. All right, we see some people signing on, so we'll go ahead and get started today. Uh, my name is Christina Schaefer. I'm one of the on-staff instructors for HAR, uh, as well as a social media manager for HAR. I'm joined this morning by Rochelle Henderson. Rochelle, uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I guess we could start off if you just want to introduce yourself so we all know who you are. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Uh, I'm Rochelle Henderson, broker associate um, with a real estate firm uh, in the Bel Air area. Um, I'm also an author of a book called uh, Selling Your Expired Listing. I'm a 2015 Texas Realtor Leadership Program graduate and chair of the advisory risk management uh, advisory group. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I didn't know you were an author as well. That is very <laughs> cool. <laughs> so how did you become the chair of the uh, risk management advisory group? Um, I was appointed by the HAR chair. Kenya Burrell, uh, Ben Warmer, mm -hmm. um, as an active member of the Houston Association of Realtors over the last four or five years, um, being engaged, she um, thought that I would be a good representative for the risk management group and appointed me to the position. That's great. Okay. Um, so what does, um, last week, or actually two weeks ago, we had uh, Jamila Lindsay, who's with the Professional Development Advisory Group. Um, the Risk Management Advisory Group is what you're the chair of. So what does the Risk Management Advisory Group do? Okay. Um, so the role of the Risk Management Advisory Group is to address non-compliance issues that affect the HAR membership. And um, it, uh, we address issues for residential and commercial real estate transactions. So first we want to address non-compliance issues. And then secondly, we um, want to provide ways to minimize um, and reduce the risk, and so we want to alert and inform our membership about it. Wow, that's great. Um, so really just has our, our membership's best interest at heart there. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Great. Um, so kind of why we're here today, what we kind of want to focus on, we know there have been some contract changes that went into, went, went into effect. Um, could you kind of explain to us maybe what changes have been made to the one before family contracts? I know there's a lot, but if we could just kind of touch on maybe some key points and things that... <laughs> Some key points, right? Um, just some things that have, you know, come up. Okay, I sure will. So the legislature meets every two years to review, um, consider, and then implement any changes to the contract. So the Texas Real Estate Commission adopted um, seven or changes to seven forms um, that were recommended by the broker lawyer group. Okay. And so this happened on February 12th, the recommendations. Um, the forms are actually the changes to the forms actually went into effect on May the 15th. Okay. So the reason that that's important, so this is a date. <laughs> May the 15th. Okay. <laughs> so the reason that that's important, it's two reasons. One, that date has already passed. So okay. that means that all um, realtors should be using the new and revised forms. But also, number two, the reason that it's important is because there could be some agents who may not be using the forms. So if you're a listing agent, you want to make sure that when you are receiving um, contracts, that you're checking to make sure that they are using the correct forms. Okay. So May 15th, we, we are supposed to be using those forms. Um, oh, Rochelle, they asked if you could sit here. How about I just scoot it closer to her? They asked if you could sit a little closer to the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> so I'll just scoot it closer because she has the good information. <laughs> okay, is that better? Just uh, let us know. Raise your hand or something. Yeah. Right. No, it's that. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll just give you um, the seven forms, the name of the seven forms, and then kind of talk about, um, go through and start talking about each. So of the seven, though, um, where changes were made, here's what you want to know, that five were contract forms, two were addendum, and then there are also two notices. I'm not going to um, address all seven, I mean all um, nine, I'll be just, uh, just addressing seven of those forms. Um, so there was a uh, Changes made to the one to four contract, changes made to the residential condo contract, changes to the farm and ranch, the new home contract, 
the unimproved property contract. So those are the five contracts. Then there was a, a new addendum for authorizing hydro, hydrostatic testing, um, and then an addendum concerning the right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. Um, and we'll also talk about the two notices um, for the right to terminate the contract. All right, so let's get started. Um, if you have the uh, one to four in front of you, great, because then you can just follow along. So we're gonna start off with um, page one, paragraph two. Paragraph two is titled property. And what you'll need to know about this paragraph is that a new section was added and it's titled reservations. Um, so paragraph two is amended to clarify that reservations of mineral rights must be done in a separate addendum. So if there are any reservations for oil, gas, water, timber, other minerals, or other interest, then the addendum for reservation of oil and other minerals, oil, gas, and other minerals, must be completed and included as a part of your contract. So it's pretty cut and dry. If there are minerals involved, you have to complete and include that addendum with your contract. So um, one note is that um, realtors should not include this in exclusions or in special provisions anymore because there is an addendum that, it, that you should use. So that's paragraph two titled property. Um, we're gonna now jump to paragraph five, which is titled earnest money. And this is probably um, one of the larger, more impactful changes. Um, and we're still on page one. So we're on paragraph five titled earnest money. So the changes to paragraph five clearly identify that that time is made of the essence. There's a time specific performance. Okay, so let's get into the details of that. So earnest money now has a time frame that it has to be delivered, period. Mm -hmm. So um, the time frame is three days. Three days. Yeah. Um, and not only does the, the earnest money have to be delivered in a certain time frame, but there's a consequence if the earnest money is not delivered within that time frame. So okay. that's, that's really the new part. Okay, so here's, here's the change. Earnest money must be d delivered within three calendar days, not business, but calendar days, um, from the effective date of the contract. So if the third day falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, then the earnest money is due on the following or the next day that's not a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday. Okay. okay. So, uh, and that's um, when we talk about three days, three calendar days, some people say, well, what time? So five o'clock, 5 p.m., mm -hmm. not midnight. So deliver it. The title company's not open at 11 p.m. It's really hard for you to deliver it at yeah. 11 p.m., <laughs> so five o'clock. Um, um, okay, so seller can terminate if, if buyer fails to deposit earnest money timely. So the seller has to notify the buyer of their decision to terminate before the buyer delivers the earnest money. So let's say you don't deliver that earnest money within the three days, it's the fourth or the fifth, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna get it there. Mm -hmm. Well, if the buyer chooses to, they can terminate the contract because you haven't delivered. And as long as they communicate that they're terminating before the earnest money is delivered, they can do it. Um, and so what that also triggers is that because the seller now has that right to terminate, there's a new notice for the seller to terminate, and we'll get into the details of that later. Okay. okay. Um, one other thing that I wanted to um, bring up is um, in that same paragraph, there is the term escrow agent, and it's throughout the contracts. Right. And we want to make sure that our membership knows that this refers to the title company and not the closing officer at the title company. Okay. A lot of people will enter the person's name and they may put a comma in the title company or they just may enter the person's name and that person's name, your, your title officer, escrow officer, um, should not be in there. And, and think about it. Let's say that you write that person's name in your contract. Mm -hmm. By the time that contract closes, that person no longer works for that title company. So now you've got to do an amendment to change that. Right. Yeah, so it is not the loan officer. It so should be the- escrow company. agent is the actual title company. That's right. Okay. Could be misleading because it's agent, <laughs> right? Um, so that is the paragraph file. Officer. That's okay. right. Okay. So now let's, um, we're still on page one of the contract, and we're going to go to paragraph six, okay. which is titled Policy and Survey. Okay. 
So um, paragraph six, section A, um, nine, um, it's titled, it's titled title policy. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, paragraph 6A is amended to add section nine to include the general mineral exception or exclusion language. Okay, okay so here's how it reads. The exception or exclusion regarding minerals approved by the Texas Department of Insurance. Okay, let me go a little bit um, in further detail. So paragraph six states that the buyer is insured against loss subject to several exceptions. Previously, there were eight exceptions, but with the addition of, the, of this change, there are now nine exceptions. So now, any reservations, oil, mineral, gas, um, that, have to, that have been described in the reservations addendum are included in the list of exceptions on the owner's title policy. Okay. So now we're going to move to um, the next change, which is still in paragraph six, but it's in section B, which is titled commitment. So in the very last sentence of the paragraph, there's a phrase uh, or the phrase due to factors beyond the um, seller's control, that phrase is removed. Okay, pretty simple. Okay. Now we're going to, we're still in paragraph six, we're going to go to section D, which is titled Objections. Um, this paragraph was amended to add and define the cure period as the time by which seller is to cure title commitment or survey objections. So it provides a specific time frame for two separate events, um, the initial event and then the revision that occurs. So number one, it establishes the time frame that the buyer has to notify the seller that the buyer is either going to terminate the contract or waive the objections if they're not cured in the cure period. Okay. And then let's say that um, there is an issue that has to be cured, the seller cures that um, issue, mm -hmm. then it starts a second um, time frame. And okay. so it establishes additional time frame for the buyer to object and the seller to cure in the instance that a revised commitment, a revised survey, or updated exception documents um, has occurred. Okay. So paragraph six, titled Objections. And as you guys are listening, if you have questions, we will be taking questions um, towards the end. So uh, feel free to just type those questions into the comments. Uh, and we'll we'll review those and make sure we answer those questions for you guys. Yeah. What else do we so have? <laughs> um, we'll move on to paragraph paragraph twenty, which is titled federal tax requirements. Um, this is on page seven of the contract. Okay. So paragraph twenty is amended to clarify two things. Um, the first is that the source for defining for defining a foreign person is the Internal Revenue Code and its regulations. So if you're looking for the definition of a foreign person, that's the source that you go to okay. for that, um, that definition. And then number two um, is that if the seller is not a foreign person, they can provide either an affidavit or what is called a certificate of non-foreign status to the buyer. So um, previously it was just that um, the seller could provide an affidavit, but now they've added that the seller could provide a certificate of non-foreign status. Um, here's a note. Um, in March of 2018, these federal tax, re tax requirements were added to the listing agreement and the buyer representation agreement. So before um, March 2018, mm -hmm. both of these agreements were silent on the issue. So now they're consistent. Um, it's added both in the contract and in those two agreements. <laughs> Putting this close to I, I see your comments that, that you're having trouble hearing Rochelle, so uh, well, I'm, I'm moving it as close to her as I can. So And I'll talk louder. There How about go. that? That works too. <laughs> or I'll start all over. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but if you have questions on some of those other yeah. forms, I'm happy to go back and answer the questions about those about those forms. Okay. Okay. So we're still on page seven of the contract, and now we're going to move to paragraph 22, and that one is titled Agreement of Parties. 
And in this paragraph, they just added two new addenda to the list of 15 forms that are already there. So there's a list of 15 forms that can be considered as a part of your contract, depending on what you know is in your contract. Mm -hmm. um, the two new addenda that are now included are the addendum for authorizing hydrostatic testing and also the addendum concerning right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. And we'll review both of those um, shortly. So that was paragraph 22. Uh, now let's go to page nine of the contract, the broker information page. So what has changed on this page is that there was previously a place for you to add um, the fax number on both the other broker side and on the listing broker side. Now they've removed the fax number and just added a phone number. Okay. So those two, two, um, two things were changed. And then um, there were also spaces at the bottom of the page for the both the buyer and the seller to initial. So there's four boxes. Those four boxes were all completely removed. Okay. Um, okay, now let's go to page 10 of the contract, the earnest money receipt page. So the change that um, has taken place on this page is that there are now separate receipt boxes added to the form. So there's one box um, to record receipt of earnest money, and it's titled earnest money receipt. Mm -hmm. There's one box to record receipt of contract, and then there's also an additional box to record receipt of additional earnest money. So you can receive each of, each of those things separately. And then at the bottom of the page, um, the spaces that were identified for the buyer and the seller to initial, those were removed. So that covers the changes to the one to four residential contract. Mm -hmm. um, now let's go to the contract for condos and the farm and ranch. Okay. Could you just give us the, the key uh, the key points again, just because we did have trouble with the audio? Sure. Um, just the key points on some of those that you just went over. Okay. Uh, just to make sure everybody got those. All right. No they, they're, they're, we're getting feedback that they can hear you now. So <laughs> uh, just want to just the key highlights. I know we can't go through them all all over again, but okay. um, just those key. Okay, very good. So first of all, May 15th is the um, date that these forms went into effect. What's important about that is we should all be using those new forms, but if you are not, it's time to change and, and um, start to use them. But also, as you're receiving contracts from other realtors, you want to make sure that they're receiving the correct contracts. They're using the correct contracts as well. Um, let's see. There were five contracts where changes were made to mm -hmm. two addendums and then two notices, and that's what we've been going over. Um, and so the key highlights in paragraph two, the um, title property, a new section was added um, that's titled reservations. And so basically what's happening, what's happening here is that if there are any reservations for oil, gas, minerals, other interest, you must complete the addendum. So you check the box um, that there are oil, you know, gas, minerals, um, and then you complete the addendum and you include that addendum as a part of your contract. You're also going to go to page 22 and check that box because they've also added it on page 22 in the list of forms, list of addenda um, okay. with the contract. So um, because they've added this um, section, the section nine, um, you should no longer use or, or um, you should no longer put this information in special provisions or exclusions. Okay. Um, paragraph five titled earnest money is probably the, you know, the most impactful or the largest change. Um, and that is where the earnest money must be delivered in three calendar days. Okay. So, um, why that's important, not only that, um, you must deliver it in three calendar days, but there is a time frame. So time is of the essence, right? Which means there's a consequence if you don't deliver it. Sometimes people will hold the earnest money. They'll, you know, wait a couple of days until they three, four, five days before they get it there, or they the the um, the buyer says they're going to wire it and they never do. So now you must deliver within three business days. So close of business on the third day, and if you don't deliver on that third day, the consequence could be that the seller has the right to terminate. Okay. okay. And so. Um, they can, the seller can terminate as long as they communicate that um, before the earnest money is, deli is delivered. So let's say it's the fourth day, it hasn't been delivered, mm -hmm. but on the fourth day, the seller hasn't communicated they want to terminate and you deliver, then you're still in 
in contract or, or, or you're still, he doesn't have the right anymore to terminate. But if it's the fourth day you haven't delivered and he puts in writing on that new agenda that um, he wants to terminate, then he has that right and, and you're out of contract. Um, we also talked about throughout the um, throughout the contract, the word escrow agent yeah. is some co sometimes confused to mean enter the escrow your escrow officer's name, and that's not actually what you should be entering. You should be entering the title company. Yeah, that's an important one. Okay. Um, let's see. We're still on page one, paragraph six, and that one's title policy and survey, and um, this one was amended, this is nine, um, this is paragraph six, section A, nine. Um, the paragraph was amended to add, uh, to include general mineral exception or exclusion. So it's really, they, they've changed the language here. Um, so it states that the buyer is insured against loss subject to several exceptions. And previously there were eight exceptions. Now there are nine exceptions because they've added the exception for mineral and oil rights. Okay. So I do see a couple questions have come through, um, and we'll definitely get to those, but one just came up in reference to uh, what we were just talking about. Um, she, Wendy was asking, is it the same ruling for the option fee? No. Okay. No. Um, when you're delivering that earnest money that's receded by the title company, when you're delivering your option fee, you're delivering it to not to the title company. You're delivering that to either the seller's agent or the buyer. Um, and no, there is no time is of the essence. Um, you know, the three day time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And someone else asked, um, Marty asked, seller wants to terminate under paragraph five. What if the buyer delivers and will not sign termination? Well, if the seller um, delivers, communicates that they want to terminate before that earnest money is delivered, the buyer doesn't have any choice because the buyer does not have to sign the the termination notice. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, let's see. We talked about paragraph four, section six B, titled commitment. This was just something that was deleted. Um, in the very last sentence of the paragraph, the phrase due to factors beyond the seller's contract was removed. Okay. Um, the highlights for paragraph six, section D, this one is titled objections. So this one was amended to add and define cure period as the time by which the seller is to cure title commitment or survey options. And what was, um, you know, the highlight for this particular change was that it adds um, a two-phased cure period. In other words, um, when the buyer gets the first um, survey title commitment, um, then they will relay back to the seller, here are the issues that need to be cured and there's a time frame. Mm -hmm. So that's the first um, time frame that is established. And then the second time frame that is established is when that seller actually cures those first issues and, and then the buyer and the buyer's agent re-review those cures. Then there's a second time frame that is established. So now there's another time frame where you have to, the seller has to get these issues cured within that time. Um, we have a, a Wendy has a follow-up question it, back to paragraph five. Um, she said, but if option is delivered after three days and received or receded, is, I'm sorry, is option still in effect? Okay, so is the option still in effect if it's delivered after three days? I think it is. So we're not talking option here. Okay. We're talking earnest money. Okay. That may be the clarification. Okay. Yeah, we're not talking about the option or the option period. We're just talking earnest money. Right. Okay. And let me know if that answers a question. If not, we'll, we'll circle back. Um, let's see, paragraph 20, which is on page seven of the contract, titled Federal Tax Requirements, um, was amended to clarify two things. One of the things was that it defines the source that the, the, the foreign person, um, or it, it tells you where to go to find the definition of foreign person. And the place that you can find that definition is the Internal Revenue Code and Regulations. The second thing that um, it clarifies uh, in paragraph 20 is that if the seller is not a foreign person mm -hmm. previously, they were able to pro provide an affidavit. And so what they, what they clarified was that um, in addition to the affidavit, you can also, the seller can also provide what's called 
a certificate of non-foreign status. So there was a question, well, what is the affidavit that you know the seller should be providing? So they've clarified that and said, or a certificate of non-foreign status. So there's a, a specific form that is called certificate of non-foreign status, foreign status, and that's what the buyer can receive. Okay. Um, let's see. In paragraph 22, titled Agreement of Parties, Parties, there's a list of 15 documents that could be considered a part of the contract. So because there are new two new addenda that were um, that were added, they've included those two. And those two new are the addendum for authorizing hydrostatic testing, and then also the addendum concerning right to terminate due to lenders appraisal. On page nine, uh, of the contract, which is titled Broker Information Page. Um, on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so in the other broker information side and then also the listing broker information side, they've removed the space that you used to have to um, insert fax number okay. for both of the brokers. Now they've just put phone number, so you enter the phone number instead of the fax number. Okay. And then also at the bottom of that page, um, there is the line that says, um, Space identified for the seller and the buyer to initial. Those have all been removed. So there were four spaces, two for the buyer, two for the seller. That's been taken off. Okay. They're no longer required. The buyers and sellers are no longer required to initial the broker information. Um, <laughs> I'm scooting closer to the mic, so I hope you can hear me. Um, okay, so um, they can hear you when you're right there. <laughs> okay. Um, page 10, the earnest money receipt uh, page. So now there are three separate boxes so that you can um, that you can receipt the earnest money, the contract, and then the additional earnest money. Um, also at the bottom of the earnest money receipt page, the boxes for the where the buyer and seller used to have to initial, that's been removed. And I think that brings us that was a full circle of everything yeah, that we covered. That was everything that we covered when there was um, some audio problems. So. Okay. Yeah. Very good. We'll go on to farm and ranch and condo. Okay. So for the residential condominium contract, let's talk about those changes. And really there was only one. Um, the, the, con the condo contract is very similar to the structure of the residential one to four. Mm -hmm. um, but the change that, that um, took place in the condo contract was that in paragraph 2B, 2, and 2C, they were amended, they were amended to clarify that the seller now bears the expense to deliver the condo documents and the resale certificate. So now the seller has to pay for those documents. Um, so that was the condo contract. Now we're gonna go to the farm and ranch contract. So um, only one change there. And in the farm and ranch contract, paragraph 2F titled reservations, section F reads, any reservation for oil, gas, or other minerals, water, timber, or other interest is made in accordance with an attached addenda. The words or special provisions that are in parentheses or that were in parentheses, they, those words were deleted. So pretty, pretty simple. So in other words, like in the one to four contract, um, you can no longer include anything about mineral, water rights, gas rights, in the special provisions. That's basically what it's saying. Do not put that in there, use the addendum. Okay. Okay, so now let's move to addendum for authorizing hydrostatic testing. So this new addendum was adopted to auth authorize um, hydrostatic test to be performed at the buyer's expense. And so um, it serves as, this addendum serves as a separate written authorization that is required. And if you look in 7A, um, page four of the contract, which is titled Access, Inspections, and Utilities, it says that yes, the, the hydrostatic test can be performed, but this specifies um, that it has to be paid for by the seller. And it also um, identifies who will be responsible should damages be caused. So either the seller, the buyer, or the buyer can be responsible for the um, damage up to a certain amount. And, and you can identify that number, like $5,000, $1,000, but you can identify the amount um, that the seller, that the buyer is willing to pay for those expenses. Okay. 
So that's the addendum. That's the new addendum for um, authorizing hydrostatic testing. The buyer pays for the test, and then it identifies and it clarifies that either the buyer or the seller can pay for the expenses. Okay. The next is the addendum concerning the right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. So this one is pretty. If there's this is a this one is new and it's huge, and so I really encourage you to to read this and be clear. And if you have additional questions, you'll probably want to get with your broker or your compliance manager or your in-house trainer mm -hmm. to go through this very specifically. Um, so Trek adopted this addendum to address the situation where parties want to create a special contingency based on the appraisal performed by the lender. So keep in mind, this addendum is not required to be used. Okay. Okay. So there are three options available to the parties in this addendum in the event that the property fails to appraise. Okay, so the first option, the buyer is giving up their right to terminate if the appraisal comes in low. So this option will likely be used in transactions when the buyer is fairly confident that the appraisal will be at or, at or above a certain amount and the buyer has access to additional cash. Okay. So they're waiving their right because they feel like the house is going to appraise and if it's a little if there's a little difference I'm okay with that because I do have, you know, additional cash that I have access to. The second option is basically the same as the first option except the buyer can put a limit or a floor on how much lower the appraisal can be. So okay. they can say, you know, if it appraises for $10,000, that's my floor, then I'm still willing to move forward with the transaction. Okay. The third option, um, the buyer can terminate the contract, contract for the property's failure to meet underwriting requirements for appraisal. In other words, the appraisal comes in low. Um, or if the appraisal is less than the value agreed upon in the blank. So you can actually document in the addendum that if the appraisal doesn't, if the sales price is three hundred and fifty thousand, um, if it appraises for three hundred and forty-five, then yes, I'll still move forward. But if it's lower than three forty-five, then no, I I want to terminate. So it gives three different options, but it's it's um, I think you really need to read it and be clear and be able to explain it to your to your clients. And again, it's not required, but the seller may want to. Right. Okay. Um, in the third option, if you are selecting that option, you do have to deliver a copy of the appraisal to the seller. So um, this box will most likely be used when a buyer wants to have the right to terminate the contract if the appraisal falls below a certain amount. Um, this is will probably be used in some cash transactions or large equity transactions. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap it up with the final two termination notices. Okay. okay. So the first one is the notice to terminate the contract and I mean the notice of buyer's termination of contract. Okay. So this one was amended to include two new reasons that a buyer can elect to terminate. The first reason is when the appraisal is not satisfied under paragraph three in the new addendum concerning the right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. And um, the second reason is a buyer can elect to terminate under paragraph 6D titled objections in the one to four sales contract. So when the objections to the title are, or the survey aren't cured mm -hmm. um, in a timely manner, then the buyer has the right to terminate. So two new reasons have been added um, on this termination notice that the buyer can elect to terminate. Okay. Um, the notice of seller's termination of contract. This is a new notice and it allows the seller to give written notice to the buyer that they were electing to terminate the contract based on paragraph five, which is that earnest money um, receipt or earnest money um, section, which says if the earnest money is not delivered in the three days, the seller can terminate. Okay. So those are the two notices. So um, thank you for that. And actually, uh, we, I have a couple more questions for you, but I know there's questions that have popped up about what you discussed. So give me just a second while I find a couple of those. Um, so one question Amanda asked, what is the best verbiage uh, to write in the blank on 6D for how many days? I think that's best, that question is best posed to your broker or okay. your risk manager or your in-house trainer because your broker may have their own in-house policy that they want all of the agents to, right. to abide by. Yeah. Okay. 
think you should do that. Um, and but let me let me go back. I do want to. What you don't want to do is put one day. I do know that because okay. um, it's it's not likely that you'll be able to cure um, cure and make a decision in one day. Right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, is there a limit to the? Uh, Kathy asked. Sorry. Is there a limit to the uh, sales amount of property for the federal tax requirement? The sales amount of the property. Is there a limit to the sales amount of the property for the federal tax requirement? I don't know that I understand the question. Okay. Um, Kathy, if you're still on, if you could um, maybe reword that question for us um, so that we can hopefully answer that for you. Okay. So... Uh, where does the non-foreign person come from? Marty was asking this question. Where does the non-foreign person come from? Mm -hmm. Marty, let me look up that section. I think it's federal tax. Oops. That's in paragraph 20 of the contract on page 7, and the paragraph is titled Federal Tax Requirements. Okay, so that was paragraph 20, Federal Tax Requirements. That's where you see the non Oh, excuse me, the foreign person. Correct. Okay. Someone asked, will this video be available later for viewing? Yes, it will. It goes up in the uh, video section of our Facebook page. You can watch it from the beginning there. Um, do we require all sellers for proof of citizen status in order to comply with the rules regarding nationality? That's a question that should be posed to your broker. Okay broker question there. Okay. Um, so here's, uh, oops, Elva asked this question. What happens if after delivering earnest money, the seller decides he or she does not want to sell at that price due to sales, due to sales price uh, and make seller pay money at closing? Okay. Let me hear that one again. What <laughs> happens if after delivering earnest money, seller decides he or she does not want to sell at that price? And then it says, due to sales price, make seller pay money at closing. I'm not sure I hear okay. all Elda, the question. Okay, if you want to try to reword that for us as well. Sometimes when we're typing these questions, we might, you know, <laughs> think that it's, it's different. Um, someone said, don't forget unimproved property. I am not covering unimproved property. Okay. So we have some additional resources we're going to give you in a second for uh, other changes and things like that. Um, where does the addendum come from? I think it's, it's part of the book here. Where does the addendum come from? It's like if there's no Trek, Do you mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what is the form number for the seller's termination form? I'll have to look that, that one up. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up for you. Um, I'll have to look that one up for you. Okay, so we can um, answer that for you, Dana, in the in the comments. We'll reply to your comment after this session uh, if we don't get it before then. Okay, Kathy reworded her question for us. Uh, are properties above a certain amount withheld withheld the federal tax, or any amount of sales price will be withheld? Read that one again. Yeah. yeah. Are, are properties above certain amount withheld the federal tax or any amount of sales price will be withheld? And I think I'm wondering, are you talking about the funds that have to be, the sales tax that have to be withheld for foreign, yeah, for persons with a foreign status. Okay. So can we answer that one in comment? Because I think I want a bit of yeah. a clearer understanding of what the true question is. Okay. Yeah, we can answer that one in, in the comment for you too, Kathy, if you want to. Um, clarify again if it's having to do with the foreign person status. status. Yes, mm -hmm. foreign person status too. Okay. Um, so um, if you guys have any more questions on anything we haven't covered yet, or maybe I overlooked your question, go, go ahead and type it into the comment section. Um, so obviously a lot of changes. Thank you for going over all of this You're with welcome. us. I know that that was a, a lot of uh, a lot of preparation on your <laughs> part to get us all that information. Um, but I know there's more and, and maybe more clarifications and things like that that could be made. So where can we learn more about these changes? Okay, so very good point because those were the highlights. I mean, those were the nuggets and it's, it's one thing to know here's the change, but it's another thing to understand the content 
um, the context of that change. Mm -hmm. And so um, the best thing for you to do is register for the HAR Pro classes um, so that you can learn more. Because those classes go into quite a bit of detail. They, they tell you, I think we had one question that asked about what number should be put in that blank. So in the classes, in the H, um, HAR Pro um, classes, uh, the instructor is actually going paragraph by paragraph and blank by blank to give you the right. context of what you should be putting in the blank. Not necessarily the number, but why it's important. And what you have to understand is that when you're talking about filling out the contract, there's a perspective from the buyer representative, the buyer's agent um, side on mm -hmm. how to fill out that contract, but there's also a different perspective from the selling agent side on okay. how to fill out that contract. And so those are the things that you want to be sure that you understand, and that's why you want to register for the HAR Pro contract classes. So I think um, with the HAR, so there is actually a designation for it too, uh, HAR Contracts Pro, uh, HCP designation, and it, it's comprised of several different classes, um, 101, 201 classes, um, there's intermediary, there, you know, so there's, there's multiple offers, things like that, that are all included in that Contracts Pro. So even if you're not looking for the designations, you know, going in there and taking these classes, um, it's helpful. Actually, there she has a handout for it. <laughs> so HR Contracts Pro, we have these classes scheduled. Actually, there's a, a contracts class going on next door uh, to us right now, too. Um, and I believe there's also a webinar coming up as well, right? Can you that's tell us right. anything about that? So there is a webinar that's coming up. It's on June 27th. It's okay. a one-hour webinar from 11 to 12. Nancy Herzig is going to um, facilitate, um, and she teaches these HAR Pro classes, contract classes. So she knows them, them in and out, um, and you'll want to, to join. The webinar is June, uh, June 27th. It's from 11 to 12, and it's the top five um, tips for writing a successful contract. Yeah, top five tips for writing a successful contract. And it's already actually, as of this morning, on the website, so you can uh, go register for that webinar or any of the contracts classes that we mentioned uh, HAR.com forward slash edu as an education. Um, Elsa did clarify her question for us too. Uh, so what will what will happen if seller decides not to sell because sales price is too low at closing? Seller has to pay and not get the money for selling. I think that might be something that we don't answer. Answer here. No, I mean, I think that first of all, the, the seller needs to talk with their s listing agent right. about how to move forward with that transaction. But I don't think that's a question for me to answer um, in this forum. Okay. Um, so under federal tax, the seller provides an affidavit. Where does the affidavit come from? Okay, so this was the clarification from the, the where does the form come from <laughs> earlier. So she said, under federal tax, the seller provides an affidavit. Where does the affidavit come from? Title company, truck, et cetera. Title company. So from the title company. Thank so that you for clarifying. That. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking, sure. Yeah, a uh, title company there. So thank you for that question, Marty, and the clarification. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, some people are saying very informative. So thank you again so much for being here. You're welcome. Um, after this, if you are watching or re-watching, um, you're not watching live, type your questions in even after this live session. We can answer those questions. I, I go through and I look for new questions and I, uh, I will get the answer for you from Rochelle or Nancy or, or a, a definitely a pro. Um, but thank you again so much for being here and uh, thank you all for joining us. I do apologize for the audio issues that we had. Um, you know, I'm still learning and, and we're still learning here. We're, we're still, this is all still kind of a new setup for us. So uh, bear with me. Uh, I'll research and I saw somebody said get a new mic. So I'll research that as well. Uh, but thank you all. Uh, and hopefully you found this informative because that's what we're really here for is, is the good information. So uh, thank you again. And we will see you next Monday. Bye-bye.